Howdy everyone and welcome to the Serial Geek TV YouTube channel. My name is James Etock and today I present to you part two of an in-depth look at the Masters of the Universe comic published by Marvel's Star Imprint, specifically how the arrival of George Carrigon changed everything. A dramatic shift. With George Carrigon taking over the writing chores with issue 9, the entire quality of the comic shifts dramatically. The first thing to notice is that there are no new characters in this story. Ok I tell a lie, there is a new character, but she's not a toy and was never intended to be one. Right off the bat, Carrigon shows his knowledge of the Masters of the Universe cartoon, or at the very least a willingness to research the source material, by introducing Uncle Montauk and Driel from Orko's homeworld. The story of Orko's desire for revenge on Hordak for the apparent death of Driel is well written, and while the Hate Stone's sudden appearance is never really explained, as a plot device they work well. The story is refreshing and it is nice to see the characters genuinely torn by the actions of their friend. One clever and somewhat amusing element to the story is that the Evil Horde have a new ship, weapon, called the War Star, which looks like a giant pyramid. The ship is powerful, but due to the energy used in transporting the ship from Etheria to Eternia, they have to constantly wait for their weapons to charge. I think this is well worked into the story because it shows that not all of the Evil Horde's plans are well thought out. There is also a reference to Marlena's Earth heritage as He-Man quotes Lord Acton's famous Absolute power corrupts absolutely and an ending that is the first decent non-preachy moralistic ending the comic has featured. It should be noted that this ending is handled a lot better than most episodes of the cartoon as the characters muse the events of the day without lecturing the audience. George Carrigon's arrival gives the comic a story that it deserves. Issue 10 continues the good characterization and storytelling established in the previous issue. In another nod to the animated series, Carrigon has He-Man transformed back into Prince Adam uttering the phrase, let the power return. This issue, more than the other four he wrote, demonstrate that Carrigon understands these characters, what makes them work and how they should interact with one another, highlighted during the scenes featuring Prince Adam and Teela, especially their final scene. It should be noted that whilst not award winning storytelling, Skeletor's plot in this issue is the best so far with him tricking the Eternians into giving him a powerful gem. Incidentally, issue 10 was actually the first issue I managed to find in the United Kingdom. Imagine my disappointment when I finally discovered the quality of the first 8 issues of this series. In issue 11 we are presented with a very interesting story. After a trip through space, both He-Man and Hordak end up on a different planet suffering from amnesia. The writing is what shines most of all in this issue. Instead of merely joining up with He-Man, Hordak asserts his independence, believing that he can survive on his own. Throughout the issue we see him struggle to make decisions and question why he is treated so harshly by the very people of this planet, a planet that the evil Horde once ruled. Hordak's change of personality in this issue does not for one second feel forced upon us and when Shadow Weaver returns his memory we are genuinely saddened for the villain as he has formed a close bond with He-Man by this point. The ending of this issue is brief but incredibly well executed with Hordak accidentally missing an opportunity to destroy the heroes. It should be noted that this comic has a couple of references to the Flash Gordon series in the form of Prince Baron and his homeworld of Arboria. Lifetime Part 1 the two-part Lifetime story that runs across issues 12 and 13 is often heralded as one of the best Masters of the Universe stories ever told, and rightly so. For the first time in the series we see Prince Adam and King Randor engaging in meaningful conversation, Randor stating that he is pleased with his son taking an interest in affairs of state, the dialogue sounding a lot like something we could have heard in the cartoon. Page 3 of this issue is very clever as it foreshadows the story. In the three panels that He-Man appears in, we do not once see his face. Every shot of him is shown from behind. Later, as Adam tells Man-at-Arms that he is tired of being He-Man, we are treated to some great dialogue, most notably Adam's declaration of, it's not I have the power, now the power has me. Adam's argument as to give up being He-Man is convincing to the point that we never truly question it, and to be honest, reading it back, I found myself rooting for him to return the Sword of Power to the Sorceress. Of course, Skeletor then shows up with a new plan. This time he has a bomb that will trigger itself upon picking up He-Man's brainwaves and explode, sending the most powerful man in the universe into the future. Unfortunately for Skeletor, Adam is in the room and the bomb sensing He-Man's brainwaves begins to count down, much to Skeletor's confusion. We are all horrified when Adam's sword disappears and again, Caragon writes Adam's despair beautifully. 
Adam journeys 30 years into the future and discovers a frightening world without He-Man, now ruled by Skeletor. The best scene in this story, and one that transcends the comic itself, occurs when Adam discovers his mother and father in Skeletor's dungeons. In an incredible few panels, Adam tells his parents that he and He-Man are one and the same. They are shocked as he proceeds to explain why he kept it a secret. Please forgive me for keeping this secret from you. I love you both. Making you proud of me is all I ever wanted. As Adam leaves the dungeon, Randall replies that he has always been proud of his son, never more so than I am today. With Adam having departed, we are treated to two truly wonderful panels in which we learn the shocking truth. Randall turns to Marlena and asks, do you think we should have told him? To which Marlena replies, no, I've always said that he'd tell us when he was ready. I knew that when I figured out his secret all those years ago, finally adding, a mother knows. In those two panels, Caragon proves that not only does he enjoy referencing the cartoon, which itself hinted twice during its run that Queen Marlena knew that Adam and He-Man were one and the same, but that he also actually cares about the comic he is writing, and not for one second is he writing down to the audience that the comic is clearly marketed for. Just when we think things can't get any more difficult for Adam in the future, he finds the sorceress who gives up her life to power a weapon given to him by his father. As the sorceress dies, she whispers to the prince, I will always be with you, my son. Adam's rage in the last panel on this page is perfectly illustrated by Ron Wilson. The final few pages of issue 12 have Adam discovering his future self and that Teela has now taken over the mantle of the sorceress, though the years since the death of her father have left her cold and distant with little emotion. The issue ends beautifully with Adam heading towards Skeletor's towering obelisk, which reads, Here lies He-Man. In the fury of the storm, Adam uses the laser weapon powered by the life force of the sorceress and rewrites the words of Skeletor's obelisk. Skeletor lies, He-Man lives, in an effort to inspire the people of Eternia. The issue's last panel has the small band of heroes preparing themselves to fight Skeletor's evil head-on. Lifetime Part 2 Issue 13 begins with the heroes camped outside Castle Greyskull, now controlled by Skeletor. As the small band of rebels begin their mission, it is revealed that Skeletor observes everything, and in some incredibly creepy scenes we see Skeletor effortlessly capture Taylor in the form of Zor. It is not long before the heroes are captured and chained in Skeletor's throne room, with the Lord of Destruction sporting elements of his live-action movie costume. Both future and past Adams retrieve the Sword of Power and call upon the power of Greyskull, resulting in the appearance of two He-Mans. As the future He-Man and future Skeletor engage in one final battle, Castle Greyskull begins to crumble all around them. As the rebels escape, the castle explodes, presumably killing both He-Man and Skeletor. Across Eternia, inspired by Adam's rewriting of the obelisk, the people rebel against the evil that has enslaved their planet, and within one single day, Eternia becomes a world of peace once more. Although having achieved a great deal, Adam is still understandably saddened by recent events and tells Teela, because of my actions 30 years ago, Skeletor enslaved my people, killed your mother and father, and caused untold suffering. After discovering a way to get back to the past, Adam remarks to Teela, I thought I could get along without He-Man, but that's like saying I can get along without accepting my responsibility to decide my future. Teela hugs Prince Adam, beautifully stating, that's what you really came here to find, isn't it? Arriving back in the past, Adam is overjoyed to see all of his loved ones alive and well. Almost knowing that the series had been cancelled, the final page has Prince Adam transforming into He-Man atop Castle Greyskull, declaring that He-Man is here to stay, with the last caption stating, never the end. Issue 13, when compared to issue 12, probably isn't as strong, but this is due to the sheer number of revelations and the power of storytelling in the previous issue. Unpublished Issues Even though issue 13 would prove to be the last of the series, it appears that plans were well underway for more stories. Many, many years ago, I stumbled upon and hurriedly purchased an impressive splash page from the unproduced issue 14. Under the title War and Peace, it appears that the series was going to take a drastic new direction as we see not only a fleet of Horde Batmechs, but also He-Man wearing his costume from the live-action movie. Sometime later, the Power and the Honor Foundation obtained more pages from this issue, as well as a few other issues that were also in production. As you can see, some of the pages are completely finished, with others still a work in progress. 
These pages provide a fascinating insight at what could have been. I mean, look, it's Lubick from the live-action 1987 movie. Speaking of the live-action movie, the war that we see in that film takes place after the two-part Lifetime story in the Star Comics canon, with He-Man, in a flashback to before the events of that opening War and Peace splash page, saying that the war on Eternia is over and that Skeletor chose his own destruction. As the flashback reveals, Hordak attacked Eternia, leading to the current events, with He-Man having to seek out the not-quite-destroyed Skeletor and team up with the Lord of Destruction in order to stop Hordak. In total, the Power and the Honor Foundation unearthed 40 pages, and one dark and gloomy evening, I worked out that there were at least two issues with a possible third in the works. Issue 14 would have also been the first of the series to drop the Star Comics logo from the cover, although like numerous other Star Comics that same month, it would have still carried the Star Comics moniker on the opening splash page. It appears that the comic was also going to have a page or two dedicated to character profiles, much like the Transformers comic was doing at the time. Before I forget, I should mention an unpublished inventory story that was referenced by writer Mike Carlin, whilst he was still a writer on the Masters of the Universe comic, in another interview with Marvel Age. Illustrated by the legendary Klaus Janssen, the story was titled Love Stinks and, of course, featured Stinkor. Bizarre to think that this completed comic book is sitting somewhere in this world, unread and unloved, just like Stinkor. Too late. George Carrigon's arrival on the series was sadly too late, and Masters of the Universe became one of many Star Comics that would end up being cancelled in the space of a few months. Unfortunately, under the banner of Marvel's Star Comics imprint, the writers would always be fighting a losing battle to command respect. The comics they were producing were seen as nothing more than comics for kids. And maybe therein lies the problem. Would Masters of the Universe have fared better outside of the Star Comics under the regular Marvel imprint, like the Transformers and G.I. Joe? I honestly believe that had the comic started with the quality of storytelling we witnessed in issue 9 onwards, we would have seen a far longer lasting comic and a complete lack of crumb bums. A legacy. Sadly, George Carrigan is no longer with us. In fact, Mark Evanier wrote a fascinating piece about his life and his all too tragic passing, which you can find online. But George Carrigan's contributions to the world of Masters of the Universe are nothing short of spectacular. I'm sure that Masters of the Universe would have proven to be a small part of George's brief life, but with this comic he made a lasting impression on the fans. He breathed new life into an ailing comic book by actually taking the world of Eternia quite seriously and writing the characters as they were meant to be written. Within the space of a few issues, George Carrigan penned some of the greatest He-Man stories ever told, and for that we should be eternally grateful to him. And that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. Please be sure to like, comment, share and subscribe and I'll catch you on the next one.